Big Tin Can is the world's leading sales learning and enablement platform that delivers the onboarding and training, preparation, coaching, customer engagement, and follow-up and insights that modern businesses need to win. Welcome to the Sales Influence Podcast, where we talk about finding the why in how people buy. I'm your host, Victor Antonio. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for lending me those ears. If you're watching this on video on YouTube, I appreciate those eyeballs. Today, I have the one and only Mr. Visionary himself, the guy who I think is really underestimating the market because he's stealth when it comes to the behavioral science of selling. Please help me welcome to the Sales Influence Podcast, Tim Reister. What's happening, Tim? <laughs> hey, Victor. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, we, you know, we work at the subconscious level. That's how come you, you know, I'm super stealth. <laughs> I became like, I know a lot of people may tell you that you're your fan, but I'm just telling you that I'm your fan. I'm going to prove it to you right now. It all started with, I'm going through the books, man. I, by the way, every year I purge books. So I have like the smallest library. You know, everybody like, I got a thousand books in my library. Every year, if not twice a year, I purge and I get rid of the stuff that I just don't want, right? It just doesn't, it wasn't really valuable. Three of your books have made it to my golden shelf, man. Three, which is like, I think you're the most. I think you've got the most books on the golden shelf that I call. This is the book I think that started it off for me, Conversations mm -hmm. That Win a Complex Sale. And, yeah. I, you know, this, was a, this is just a brilliant book. This book is so underestimated, Tim. You know, uh, I, I derived a lot of the pattern interrupt stuff from your hammock analogy, you know, and how to keep people engaged. And so every time I heard you teaching things, I was like, man, this guy's just, he understands the brain. The next one was Three Value Conversations. That's an easy one. But I got to tell you, my latest favorite was the Expansion Sale. This one right here, what I loved about this book uh, is that it really gave you a lot of, it gave you a lot of words to say. In other words, strategies, tactics, and a mindset for it. And so I, I wanted to prove to you that, that I am an Uber fan, not just like everybody, I'm an Uber fan, and I love your content and i know I'm, I'm putting you on a pedestal right now before they even know, know who you are Whew, yeah. you know but anyway so let these folks know i know who you are i kind of know who you are please let these folks on the sales influence podcast know who you are well i appreciate all that the golden shelf i didn't know that was a thing and uh but it sounds like a good thing so i'm, I'm gonna just take that at face value today I uh, yeah, so my name's Tim Reister, and my my current role is I'm the chief strategy officer at a company called Corporate Visions, and I also run as a, sort of a sidelight at Corporate Visions, what's called B two B Decision Labs, and so we are doing original, fresh, exclusive research in the area of how buyers buy, how they frame value, how they make choices, and we're then baking that into consulting and training engagements. Um, but we're also sharing a lot of it in books and webcasts and, and, and whatnot. We're very, we very much believe in the abundance mentality when it comes to these things. But the real, I guess the real shift here is looking at how you communicate or articulate value from the buyer's brain perspective, like how you can affect it as opposed to just like how you should act. And uh, sometimes you're taught to act a certain way and you don't even know why it gets or doesn't get the reaction you're looking for from the prospect or customer and knowing what you can do and knowing why they react, I think is, is a game changer uh, because then you know how to nuance and how to leverage and finesse that. Uh, oftentimes we teach salespeople skills and they go in like just barnstormers and, uh, and it's like, yeah, maybe, maybe not so much. Uh, but I think once you understand what it's doing inside of your prospect or customer, then you know how to handle it more wisely. Yeah. And by the way, you guys are very generous with your content. I sign up for your newsletter every time you're doing a webcast. If I don't catch the original, I catch it on the replay as well. So uh, Corporate Visions would probably be the best place to go sign up for that. Is that a true statement? Yes, absolutely. Yep. CorporateVisions.com. We have created a B2B Decision Labs.com. As uh, we look to sort of elevate that as a meaningful research oriented uh, and advisory oriented brand in the market as well. Do you get frustrated, Tim? Uh, and I'm kind of leading you here because I get frustrated, but I'm wondering if you get frustrated or as, as frustrated as I do. The, I, you know, I have an engineering background, so I kind of, I love, you know, the science. I love empirical things. And you, you seem, you slash your companies, companies seem to really care about the science behind selling, whether it's on the supply side or the demand side, you know, what are some of the things that you see that maybe irritate you in the market today when you see some of the content that's out there? Um, yeah, I mean, such a loaded I, question, I, right? Such a loaded it, question. It, right, <laughs> I'm just trying to, you know, just like keep my cool. Um, <laughs> let it go, man. Let it go. Let it go. 
<laughs> there is there is a lot of things, a lot of opinions that pass as as proof. Uh, yeah. I call it anic data. It's, yeah. it's not really data. It's just anecdotal. It's based on personal experience. And the problem is, even if we have a personal experience and we have a terrible time actually knowing what caused it. And right. we try to reinvent it in our heads and say, this is what worked for me. Right. And now you should all know it. And people write books on that and they, they have all kinds of um, influencer type status. And I go listen at these conferences and I'm the worst audience member. I mm -hmm. want to like, do you have a study for that? Do you have a study for that? Like... Is there, where's your study for that? <laughs> and, and I, cause and people are taking notes and taking photos of these slides. And I'm like, come on, yeah. what? <laughs> have a higher bar. Uh, <laughs> We're kindred spirits. I'm not alone. I, you know, I am that, I'm the worst audience member because I'll sit there and almost do the same thing. Like, really? Is that just an opinion? You know, and it just, I really have a hard time. Uh, so, so what are some of the things you're seeing out there like lately that just kind of like, you know, that's wrong. We shouldn't be training on that. Well, and I'm not even going to say we, sh we shouldn't have ever been training on it, but some things are just like worn out. Um, like I think traditional 20, 30, 40 question discovery is not adding enough value. Um, oftentimes you're trying to win new business against an entrenched competitor, whether that competitor's an arrival of yours or some way they're doing it themselves. And, and the only way that you can get somebody to change your mind is, is to show them something they didn't know or didn't expect. We call them unconsidered needs. And the problem is by asking 20 or 30 questions, you can't uncover unconsidered needs because by definition they're unconsidered and there's just not enough energy in what comes out of traditional discovery to get people to change their mind. I mean, because they already know those problems. They already exist in those problems. They're not dead yet. You know, the thing they're worried about is the thing that could kill them and they don't know what that is. And that's why they worry about it. So the expectation is that you bring more value than just being a tape recorder. And you got to figure out a way to bring that value so that somebody's grateful they spent that time with you and feels like they came away smarter. Um, not just feel like they were like dragged through the La Brea tar pits. Yeah. <laughs> if I'm, if I'm that, uh, if I'm that, uh, SDR, BDR, maybe an AE that actually does, you know, the 20, 30, 40, 50 questions on discovery, you know, what are some things that I should really, you know, where should I shift my mindset? Give me something tactical that, you know what, if you're doing this, here's what you should be doing. That's more effective. Yeah. I'm never going to say a question doesn't count. But what I, what I am going to say is you, you have to, it, that question needs to be dripping, literally bathed in insight. And here's how you do it. We teach a concept called D I Q stands for data insight question. You don't open with the question. You share a piece of data, an unexpected piece of data. Maybe they hadn't seen it before. Uh, maybe they didn't appreciate the size, the scope, or the speed of that issue. You lay it on them and then you share an insight. And by that, I mean, tell them why it's happening. This is why it's happening. Like you have to have the, you have the, you can't just, just flex a factoid and have everybody go, Ooh, you have to actually then diagram it like diagramming sentences. See, I'm a journalism major. You're an engineering major and I same, same thing, but just with words. Um, then you have to sort of diagram or dissect it for them and say, here's why we see that happening. And the reason you can do this is because you see more people and more companies that look like them than they do. So you just need to act like that. Here's some data we're seeing in other people that look like you. And when this isn't working or this isn't moving the way it should, here are the three reasons that's happening. And all of a sudden, now you go, hey, how does that look in your organization? How does that feel for you in your, conver in, in your uh, company? Um, the questions last. And the idea of the data and the insight is to earn the right to ask a question. But now the question's loaded. And, and the idea is you're sort of taking them on a journey. I always say you're taking them to a hill you can win on. And uh, because the problem with 30 question discovery is you find problems they have, but there are a lot of them are things you're not going to be able to solve for. And eventually they're going to figure out you're, you're the wrong person they should have in the room because they got other problems that they need to talk to somebody about. This is, this is how you add value and guide the conversation. So data insight question is a very tactical tool um, for, for uh, being engaging, uh, having it feel like the, the person's having a great experience, but yet you're also moving this thing forward. 
I, I love that. They, I never looked at it that way, but I love the fact that you're leading them somewhere. So a, a hill you can win on. I love that, that saying. But I, I think what's even more important when you just say, and I know you just say because it's like it's, it's second nature to you, but it's earning the right to ask a question. And if you mm. built that up, you can ask a very powerful question, maybe even a very demanding question of the customer that they'll want to give you more information based on what you've just said and what you've just shown them. Would that be a true statement? Yeah. In fact, we call those provocative questions mm -hmm. because they, they, they provoke or evoke right. additional detail or they come from a visceral place. Like, how do you feel this is working in your company? How, what have you heard in your company? Mm -hmm. Like you ask them the, the question to respond to what they just heard, but mm -hmm. then ask them sort of an emotive, deeper question. The, the thing that I, I find is that people believe you must ask questions because that's what consultative people do. Right. Actually, consultative people add value by telling them something they didn't know because uh, uh, you've been there and done it before. Uh, everybody can ask the same 20 or 30 questions. So, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so your question all of a sudden is very provocative because you've given them a frame. And I always like to say you've got them trying it on now. Like as mm -hmm. they hear you talk about the data and the insight, they're thinking, am I doing that in my company? Is this what it smells right. like in my company? Right. And then when you ask them that question, they've already started to uh, take ownership of the the data and the insight, and they're they're comparing themselves. Uh, you gave them a chance to become mm -hmm. a voyeur because you're like, here's the data, here's the insight we're seeing in a lot of other companies just like you. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you think you match up? And that's irresistible to people when you're a voyeur and you're benchmarking at the same time. I love like, it. People just sort of jump into that fray. Yeah, I, I, I want to regress a little bit with you because you, you have, you know, when I watch your content online, you know, you have a way of delivering content in such a way that I think obviously informative, right, and insightful, right? But you also do it, especially when you're drawing. You just go nuts when you're drawing with your marker, man. You just go nuts. You do stuff on your iPad, you just go nuts. You're all over right, the right. place. Whether you're <laughs> virtual or live, there's always a chance to draw. Yeah, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a very engaging style. And I remember you showed, um, uh, and this was kind of like, you know, a proof point for me was that you showed, if I just show, if I do PowerPoint, the retention is this. If I do whatever image with a word on it, the retention is this. And then you said, but if you use like a, like a flip chart and you're writing, the retention is this. And you've managed to incorporate, which is why I'm going to encourage everybody to really go look at your content online. Cause you're, you're like one of the few speakers. And again, I'm not trying to be too nice to you here, but you, Brent Adamson, and probably like Bob Muesta, who wrote Demand Side Sales, like are three people I look up to, like greatly, truly, because I'm like, these guys not only have the background knowledge, but the way they present, the way they share the, you know, share the concepts that people go, I get it. Where did that come from, man? Where did, where did that come from? How did you become such a great communicator? You know, I, I, again, I'm going to argue that journalism is a great background or training for people because you learn the inver inverted pyramid. You know, you, you wrote things for the audience, first of all, and, and their ability to consume it and, and, and their, um, and a way to engage them. So they want to read more. Uh, but you also wrote it in a way that it was simple and concrete enough for them to grasp, to imagine, uh, to put themselves in the story. And, and, uh, so here's the thing that we know is that the decision-making part of the brain is, is very simple. Um, and it does not contain the capacity for language. So it, it requires something other than a lot of language or words. It does require visuals, but it's so simple that it requires simple visuals. Um, it does not like abstraction or, or complexity. It likes simple and concreteness. And so I like to draw visuals that are simply numbers, arrows, boxes, and a couple words to, and, and then I frame it in a story because the brain can handle it in two ways the brain can handle it. I often invite everybody to draw along with me to capture this. And every, th every visual that I use to tell a story is simple and concrete enough to redraw. And my bumper sticker there is, if you can draw it, you can do it. So you can take a complex idea, abstract idea, and visualize it in a simple, concrete graphic image, some sort of whiteboard-esque image. And now all of a sudden, it's you, you can't unsee it, you can't unhear it because you just did it. And there's just science behind both that level of visualization and that idea of getting someone engaged in doing it with you to, to process that with you. Um, it's like note taking, right? But in this, now it's a visual and you can go back and look at it and you instantly know what that story was. You keep mentioning the hammock, the hammock, the hammock. 
Uh, that one, that's like when I leave a conference and I've drawn the, you know, the attention hammock in terms of how to do a presentation, people like, they don't even remember my name. They're just like yeah. in the hall. They're just like, Hey, hammock guy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, so there's that's power. power. It is so powerful. That's by the way, that, that concept changed my presentation style to a great extent. So on stage, I'm always thinking about the hammock or the pattern interrupts. That, that you layer and you sprinkle throughout. You mentioned the inverted pyramid, right? Begin with the end in mind, what they want, and then deliver that. You said simplicity. The storytelling piece, I think, is, 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 credible, in, is incredible. How do you, like, you know, you come out with a new study, right? Mm -hmm. You come out with a new study. You, you've done the study. You, what, I don't know, 9,000 surveys. You've, got, you've drawn some conclusions. You've done your regression tests and all those wonderful things. Now you have to present this, Right. Because salespeople have to do the same thing, right? We got this data showing our product works, can help you. You got this. You know, what's your process? You kind of highlighted some already, but try, see if you can get a little more granular. Like, how do you begin to put something together go, will people get this? And how do I make it impactful? What's the, what's the TIM process when you do that? Well, this is fun because I, I, I work with professors, you know, high end. We have a brain lab. We have a cognitive neuroscientist who actually runs brain studies with <laughs> EEG caps and the rest. And we're running field studies. We actually don't run surveys. We'll run either simulations or live field studies. Okay. We have about 40 companies who are willing to engage us with studies on a regular basis. And those are run by credible, credentialed professors who know how to run these types of studies. They joke, they call me a popularizer mm -hmm. um, because I help them frame it then so that the takeaways are, are getting simple and concrete. So that's perfect, by the way. I just want to say that is perfect. That is a perfect descriptor for you. A popularized. popularized. <laughs> yeah, I really, because and that, and that, that, it should have a very positive connotation because it's like you take something that's dry, you, you, you restify it, right? And then, you know, it comes out and you're like, oh, that's pretty cool. Where before it just looked like just a heap of stuff, a data. And then you make it look very, and then you go, oh, and it becomes popular. Anyway, sorry about that. Well, it's funny because we, we just did a study that I'm, I'm now putting together in, in the area of how do you get salespeople to use the content you built for them? And, um, and the professor who did it said, I'm going to work with three other professors to create an academic article, you know, get it into a journal peer reviewed. And he acknowledges that like maybe his mom will read it, but, um, you know, professors need that for their, their tenure and all that stuff. But, you know, now we're going to, but we'll put a webcast out on this finding way before that ever sees the light of day. And, um, it's, and that's my job is to now help craft those, those data points. So I'm always looking for this. Where's, where is the, where's the counterintuitive finding? Where's, where's the thing that people would not expect? And then when they hear it, they slap their heads going, but of course, because if that's something they didn't expect, and then it seems too hard, they won't do it. Like a lot of people like to say, overcomplicate things. And, and, and then it's like, you sound smart and it's not that your, your data is bad. It's all good, but nobody can do it. So I'm always looking for the counterintuitive thing that people go, oh, they lean in, right? The, 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 the survival mechanism in their brain goes, I might be missing out on something here. I've got to lean in. And then it's got to be like, oh, but of course, um, because now I can do that tomorrow because I've got the data to prove it and it's doable. So I'm always looking for that angle. So in the research, there's always a bunch of findings, but there's one, there's one that you just didn't necessarily see coming. Uh, we had a study that a uh, teaser uh, on how to activate sales. When you put a piece of content out for salespeople to use, um, how do you get them to use it? And we tested this idea of having a video along with this new content asset where one, the sales leader, the SVP of sales talks about this new piece of content and how you might use it. And then we had the product manager whose product was in the, con like they should be the subject matter expert. And then the third group was a high performing seller. And we put people in different cohorts so they didn't see the other videos. They only saw the one. And then we just scored their willingness to use and their usage of it. And what we found interestingly enough is that the rookie reps, the rookie, the newer reps, they were much more like they were, they were willing to listen to a sales leader, um, probably because like it, you know, it's a boss and they think they should listen. The experienced reps, you might be able to figure this out. They listened to the high performing seller, um, and nobody listened to the product marketer. <laughs> so, 
Um, and so like, it's, it's not that that's, that, that part's not the counterintuitive part, but yet when people launch stuff in their company, if you look what they actually do, it's often rolled up by marketing. Um, and sometimes they think, oh, we need the top down. But the reality is go find a high performing salesperson who will demo or share in sort of a case study, like, here's how I would use this, or let me show you how I'd use this. And, and you will, you will create more intention to use and more willingness to use and more belief in that content asset, um, when you roll it out that way. And so don't take the easy route out companies and, and say, here, just, just have our, our marketing lead who built the, built the product and built the piece, um, talk about it, um, work a little harder and find somebody credible to, to, uh, deploy it and not just tell you what it's about but actually show it in action. So anyways, that's the kind of stuff that, like there's a whole lot of studies, there's a whole lot of cuts and whacks at the data, but we will, we will boil some of this down to just a couple um, uh, insights that will, like everybody goes, tomorrow, I can change that tomorrow. I, I can get a win tomorrow. And that's what we're always looking for. Damn it. I don't usually swear on my podcast, but that was fucking brilliant, man. Do you know what I mean? It was like, it was like, it, it's one of those, I've never thought about that. So I'm having my moment, right? The aha moment, like, uh, obvious, right? I just did that. Uh, you, so you must have just set me up with that because I'm thinking, I go, you're right. The, 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 I guess the messenger, you know, will make the message more palatable depending on which audience. And I never thought of meshing those two up. That is brilliant, man. Well, I would, what I would say is it's dramatic, the difference. So it's not even a like, like, uh, it's okay if we go this direction. It's yeah. like, I, it's malpractice if I right. keep doing it this way. I've got right. to do it. Like, you can't get that. Now you can't get that out of your conscience. No, it's, right? it's there. That's... You messed me up. And the, and the <laughs> thing is, it, you immediately messed me up now because I'm like, I've been, I've been you know, you you because people always ask me, like, I'm sure companies ask you, like, how do we onboard people faster, right? That's one. How do we, how do we get these people who we know, uh, when I look at salespeople, it's good clay or bad clay. Bad clay, throw them away, fire them, <laughs> right? Good clay, you can mold them and make them better, right? And they're all saying, Victor, how can we make these better, you know, clay salespeople? And this is just another, I guess, you know, I don't know, what do you call that? Another arrow in the... Uh, Whatever that thing whoever. is, sure. yeah, that you go, well, maybe you, it depends on who delivers the message. Because usually they yeah. call me in as a sales trainer says, and I get this a lot. I wonder if you get this a lot. It'd be interesting to get your perspective. People bring me in and I said, well, what do they need to know about? You know, what are they struggling with? And they tell me, and then they go, well, what do you, t what have you trained them on? And they tell me what they, I go, well, that's what I'm going to train them on. And he goes, Victor, there's a difference though. He says, you're coming from the outside. Mm -hmm. And they see you as an expert from the outside, even though you're saying the same thing that I would say to them. Do you, do you find that a lot? I mean, what's your thought on that? That still happens, right? Yeah. I mean, because everybody's got their opinion on why someone's a top seller or, or not. And, and so here's how I usually do it. When we help a company build a new message using one of our frameworks, I'll, I'll go to do a kickoff keynote. Um, and I'll talk about the science behind, let's say, the why change story or in, in the case of the expansion sale the why stay story or the why evolve story. And, and, and I tell them the science and, and that way I'm credible. I've done the research. Here's the data. Here's the resulting framework. Oh, by the way, we just built you a new message using this framework. Now, hopefully everybody's pretty excited about, oh, good. Now I believe this. And now I know why this message will be the way it is, but I never demo it. I then say, and here is Mary, one of you who helped us in the work to build this message. Hey, you know, give, you know, give her a little bit of mercy here because she's going to do this live on stage for you to show you how she would use it. We always look to bring someone of them and it's usually somebody who helped us build the message, but I'm doing what you said, framing the study, the data, you know, I always credential, we work with 300 companies every year. We train a hundred thousand salespeople every year. So now everybody's like, oh, he must know something. And, uh, and so then they can step back and, and, and go again, as we talked about, geez, um, uh, if this is what's going on and I'm not doing that, I find 25 year veterans reconsider everything after I've done a keynote, but then, then they want to see, well, yeah, you silver tongue devil, you can right. deliver that, but uh, guess, what, yeah. I'm not sure that would work in our company. And then right. boom, Mary walks up there and, and delivers it. 
I love it. I, lo I never thought about that's a great ploy, by the way. I never thought one two punch, one two punch. Yeah, the you know, and I love like in your book, the expansion sale. What I really loved about this book, I went through it twice actually, because the and, and as you highlight, it's the frameworks, the frameworks and the messaging and how you message it out, but also it's it's the the simple logic you tie to this. That's also obviously based on these studies, right? That you've mm -hmm. done, and and I love the way you do that. And very few, you know, like you're. When you put a book out, Tim, I buy your book blind. Like, literally, I'm not joking. I buy your book blind. Uh, Daniel Pink's book, I love his books. I buy his books blind. Like, yeah, just give me the copy, you know. Yep. Uh, and, and so when, when you're looking at the market today, if we can talk about what's happening today, what have you seen? Like, I mean, don't give – you know, I don't want to hear about the obvious pandemic shift and, you know, the, you know, the digital adoption and all that. But what have you seen in terms of – is there anything you've noticed in the market – about either on the on the on the on the buying on the buyer side, how they're buying has anything changed? I'll just leave it at that. Has anything really changed? Um, so we live in the psychology of decision making, and um, we believe that's just part of our <laughs> constitution, our makeup, right? The way we're wired and designed. And I don't think any of that changes. Here's the problem with survey based work: is there's a piece of science that you probably know called declared versus revealed preference. People declare one thing in a survey, but do something else when they're actually in the moment. And this is, this is why we don't do surveys because people lie, not on purpose. They just unwittingly lie. So we're always putting people in simulations or actual field studies, or even see their subconscious in the brain lab. And what we find is that humans are humans. And even globally, humans make decisions the way humans make decisions. And the functional parts of our brain and decision-making process have not changed. Though the channels we may consume some things in have changed and the, and the um, maybe how much we consume in certain channels versus traditional channels has definitely changed. But in it, all I'm saying is now maybe you have to take that brain science and export it to an ebook as opposed to a presentation. But it's not like they're never going to do a presentation. I think there's just there's more avenues where you have to take the science that we've uncovered and apply it to. It used to be that your emails and your voicemails and your eBooks and your this is and that's, they kind of did their own thing. And unfortunately they were often company product centric because they are now such an integral part of the decision-making process. I want to self-serve. I want to self-serve. Uh, they have to have the same selling um, mindset and psychology, buying mind mindset and psychology as you're, as you were training your sales reps. And this is the thing that I think like product managers and marketers need to really shift gears and figure out how to make sure that the content assets have the same psychological buying and selling underpinnings as your sales conversations did. Um, I think you just have to treat those as self-service conversations. And then the others are sales led conversations, but Regardless, they're both conversations with the customer right. and, and create that singular experience. And, you know, one of the biggest problems in the market, I just jotted it down, I'd love to get your take on it, is that I don't know what the number is because everybody throws out different numbers in terms of the actual content that market, marketing produces and the actual content that's used by, the, you know, direct mm -hmm. sales force. You know, how, you know, based on, you know, from your perspective and your studies, how can companies make you know, that close that gap between what they produce and what the salespeople use. What have you seen that's working out in the market? Um, it, it, that is a hard one uh, because there's multiple reasons stuff doesn't work for the seller, but it's it, one, it's usually too product centric. So how, it's got to be more customer centric, but it also has to be more relevant to the moment that the customer is engaging it. So here's, here's what I would say that's sort of changing the game. Um, we I have this phrase, I say, Sellers are going to be on a cadence, not on an expense account. And, and to be helpful to their customers, sometimes they, they, the customer is going to wait to accept a meeting and you have to be able to give them some content that advances the cause. And I think as you think about, I need to do eight to 14 touches. I can't poop out after three touches, but I can't just keep leaving voicemails and emails. I need to give them something of value. Um, looking at what those touches are, what those moments are in the buying journey and, and being crystal clear and, and very crisp with the content assets that do that job. Um, and so that's why, again, the science of a sales conversation that helps convince somebody to change 
that needs to be in that asset because somebody is going to read an asset that convinces them they might need to talk to a salesperson. And, and does your, does that content asset do that? Does that create that, the demand for them to now speak to somebody to bring additional insight and clarity? Um, or did you just <laughs> throw it all up in there and, 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 and I th hope it was going to be an e-commerce reverse auction and salespeople would go away. Um, so I hope that I, that wasn't a yeah. terribly clear answer. I think the thinking of sales touches one, yeah. uh, and where your content plays and the job it needs to do. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing, because you know, our work is it needs to be relevant to the, the buyer situation, the psychology. Is this an acquisition move and I got to be provocative? Or mm -hmm. is this a win back? So stay tuned. We have new research on right. the difference between win backs and, and traditional acquisition. Or is this a retention or renewal? Or right. is this an expansion upsell? So understanding the moment, the buyer mm -hmm. psychology um, for that moment are imperative for you to build content assets that actually move the needle. So two, qu two questions, a follow up on that one. One is, do you have a new book coming out soon? Um, we are, we're going to be releasing stuff. Here's how books happen. Yeah. We release stuff in chunks. Like, so right. the expansion sale, right. if there's four big chunks in there, there's the renewal story. There's the price increase story. There's the apology, uh, framework. And then there's the upsell expansion framework. Those were individual pieces of research that eventually we said, wow, there's enough there for a book. Um, uh, and so, um, we are doing some work right now toward a book on virtual presentations because we've done a ton of brain study research in the last two years on how to be effective in virtual presentations, but you've probably seen them come out in eBooks and webinars. Um, so i um, sorry uh, to burst anyone's bubble, but our books are a summary, <laughs> like many books are, of, of, of the work we've done in the previous years. So we are scheduling a virtual presentation book to be written and published by the end of 2023. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we've got some fascinating studies in the area of winbacks. I don't know if there's enough for a book there, but there's certainly enough for a, a, a section of a book. Uh, so we'll probably drop that as eBooks and videos and whatnot, uh, courses that you can take. Um, here's a funny, uh, unexpected truth. Winbacks, the, the customer in a winback situation behaves more like a prospect than a former existing customer. It, it takes more of a wide change or what we are now calling we've changed um, move. It takes just like they, decisions are hard. And when they make one and they make one to move to someone else, like it's hard to get them back. So it's less about coming in and just sort of reminding them of the good old days and hoping they'll come back. It's, it's gotta be a little more provocative than that. So that was kind of a, it was kind of funny, uh, and counterintuitive for ourselves, um, to find out that it, former customers act more like prospects than they do customers. It's um, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So more to come. Yeah. On the, and, and by the way, I would say that even if your stuff is, you know, pumped out, you know, in chunks or pieces, I think what your books do is they provide, I'll say the connective tissue and the structure to pull it all together, which is where I think the real value is. Uh, I, I wanted to back, back to the content management. Let me, let me attack it from a different angle. Yep. The, do you think just so we can play forecaster here for a second because I, I think that's not going to change. In my mind, I'm, I'm just a pessimist that, you know, marketing will be here, salespeople will be here, never the twain shall meet type of thing. And is there a possibility that we now evolve to, and, and I know people use chief revenue officer or chief sales, you know, operations, you know, could that be the move that we bring these under this one umbrella, whatever, it's a CRO, a CSO of a different type, where we bring in sales, marketing, and maybe even customer support, success, whatever you want to use, does that seem like a more feasible approach moving forward since marketing now seems to be a more prominent player in the, as you say, the buying preference, right? Preference formation, I think you called it. Mm -hmm. Something has to give. So I was just talking to somebody who just, a CRO, mm -hmm. who just brought together three lines of businesses and, and under the CRO, but one of the groups, he's like, I think I need to bring the go-to-market team under this as well. Right. And, and I said, well, explain to me what go-to-market is. Well, it's, it's basically the packaging of what my, people might've called field marketing in the past. Like mm -hmm. it's demand gen, it's, it's, it's content creation. It's not branding and sponsorships and mm -hmm. all the other marketing 
it, I'll, I'll call it a downstream piece of marketing. Okay. And I'm like, that feels like it's a natural uh, thing to, to roll up under a, a CRO organization mm -hmm. with your traditional sales operations and your sales enablement, right. which is sort of now that the, the new sales learning is now sales enablement. So now you have your go-to-market messaging content uh, mm -hmm. campaigns and cadences team fully integrated with right. the sales ops, the tech stack there and sales enablement, sort of that learning, developing, equipping, uh, group. Now imagine they're all rolled up to then the head of commercial enablement, those right. three boxes under the CRO. Um, so I think there's a, there's a, mm. still a layer underneath the CRO, uh, for this larger revenue or commercial enablement role. And it takes a piece of marketing enablement and ops. Yeah. But I would agree with you that the CRO, because it's all about revenue at that point, mm -hmm. um, we are absolutely seeing the CS team become more recognized as part of the revenue engine, not just the cost center necessary to ensure renewals. Correct. Um, so when you look for a CRO move, I think there's a piece of marketing coming into it and CS because that that's your first touch point for existing customers is what CS is generating um, mm -hmm. for for renewals and net new opportunities. So that's what we're seeing. And that's what we're saying. That's what, that's what we're saying in the market too. Mm -hmm. And we're encouraging it. And if companies are still siloed, we're still trying to operate that, like glue them together in a way, mm -hmm. stitch it. Yeah. Um, at least across a, a certain level services, even if you can't get the orgs aligned, you take like a piece of it because you can see it as, well, this is an integrated effort. It's a work stream. So I, we think of it as like a strategic work stream where yes, the three groups, marketing, sales, and CS are still their own groups, mm -hmm. but you create a certain work stream, let's say for a major cross-selling initiative. We found right. a ton of white space right? and, uh, or we just acquired <laughs> a company and we got to sell that. Marketing needs to be involved in their part, sales in their part, right. and CS in, in business reviews, et cetera. So we can create a work stream around, let's say a cross sell right. or a work stream, let's say around new market opportunities mm -hmm. where you can glue together these three organizations and get them working together. And we just help facilitate that mm -hmm. until such time as your org can evolve. Um, you create work streams. <laughs> I love that. I've never heard that phrase, by the way, work stream. So, but, but I love the concept of this. Tim, this is a 2024 book, maybe? I, <laughs> I, I, you know, it's I'd love funny. to see you take a shot at it, man. I'd love to right. see you take a shot at it. Come on. I, uh, if I, if it wasn't, you know, helping run a company, yeah, uh, I know. Yeah, <laughs> a little the other thing about influencers, right. Is like, we're, we're running like a hundred million dollar consulting and training company. Uh, I have regular departments and people that right. roll up to me and, uh, I got to research productize, deliver. Uh, and uh, yeah. not just influence. Yeah. So there's a, there's no offense to influence. No, 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 no. It's a, <laughs> by the way, no. I the, the thing is, I look. I I am caught in. What do you call that when a, when when a, when a bike gets behind another bike so they can kind of reduce the friction? Yeah, you're drafting. Drafting, uh, right? So <laughs> I, I am drafting corporate visions and several other companies. And you guys do all the research. I'll just wait, you know, to, to see what you got coming out of the research. And I love bringing your stuff to market. Right. And so if, if you see a lot of my presentations, your name is bantered about quite a bit. Corporate visions as well, because I really love that's that's my philosophy. Right. It's like they're doing the research, something I would never want to do. I, I don't want your job, Tim. You know, I don't want it, have no desire for it. But I love the results that come out of that. And I really love, you know, I'm, I'm helping you popularize. I, I'm, I'm one of your disciples, man. I'm one of your disciples. on top of the popularizer. <laughs> yes, that's right. Popularizer super, square. Super, super uh, I, popularizer. I wanted to hit a subject with you that uh, you touched on briefly, but I think it's important. I think it's, it's going to be the subject, as you say, maybe your next book, which is the virtual engagement piece. You did a couple of webinars on virtual engagement. I think I forgot the... The, the lady's name, but she was also doing some research with you, and she did part of the presentations as well. Can you hit on that a little bit? Because I don't think this is going away. Virtual engagement is not going away. Virtual presentations definitely are not going away. You, right. know, you know, expand on that a bit. What might be happening in the future with that? Yeah, so um, our, we have a, a science officer in our company. Her name is Dr. Carmen Simon. Uh, she's a double PhD neuroscientist and she runs our brain labs. Wow. Straight up nerd. nerd. Straight up nerd. Right. But, you know, very, very uh, eloquent uh, speaker in her own right. Right. Uh, and and always studying, watching people in EEG brainwave caps, eye tracking, facial recognition, galvanic skin response and cardiac ECG cables. 
just to look at and see how people are either fatigued or motivated or remembering. There's all kinds of things you can test with all these inputs. And we're having them watch virtual presentations. And, and sometimes they're like live presenters. Sometimes it's, it's on a video, but either way they're being presented to. And um, we've learned a lot about what kind of experience a seller needs to create in that environment. Because bottom line is, uh, this is obvious, but you went from being the star in the room and your PowerPoint was a backdrop to now all of a sudden your slides are the star and you're just a postage stamp. And, and so now you had to figure out, like, is my presentation deck and is my presentation style, um, does it have enough juice to, to live in this environment? We call it, you, there's a stimulation threshold you must meet in the virtual environment because people, when they see a screen in front of them, subconsciously have a whole different level of expectations about how much movement they're going to get and sort of how drawn into the story they are. And, um, and if you thought you had to do that live, you have to do it even more so in a virtual engagement, even if you're speaking live. So we've learned a lot about different tools and techniques you need in a virtual presentation to make them memorable, engaging, sticky. We call them precise memories. How do you create precise, how do you deposit memories that they precisely remember days later when it's decision time and they took it away? So I can walk through a couple of those real quickly. Um, one is to turn your agenda slide into something really productive. We call it now your 10% slide. Knowing that people will only remember 10% of your presentation, make it the most important 10%, like the stuff that will really distinguish you. And that means you got to repeat it a lot. And the only thing that repeats a lot in a presentation potentially is an agenda slide. Like you can keep bringing it back and say, all right, we are going to cover these three things. Now you get, you get to the end of that first thing and you're like, we just covered this. Now we're going to cover that. Like the agenda slide pops up all the time. So now turn it into something useful. Your 10% slide should be this. Have a title that is stated as a reward for the audience. Basically, here's what you're going to get when you leave here. And then have three supporting points that are action-oriented. There are three actions that you're going to take, be able to take after you're done listening to me that will get you this reward. And then as you go through, you take action point one and, and talk about it, remind them, introduce action point two, get to the end of that, refresh and remind them about the first two points, and then introduce the third. In a 20-minute presentation, you can, you can bring that slide back without feeling forced six to eight times which is what we're discovering you need to deposit a very precise memory. So the 10% slide replaces your agenda slide, uh, but it becomes your agenda. I hope that makes sense. That's just a huge one. That's a huge one because memories are so hard. This is such a fleeting moment right here. And then I would say the other one you kind of talked about, and, I, I, and you've seen me do, but it translated. turns out we tested it in a virtual environment. It translates very well. Animation, annotation, things need to build. You don't just put a slide up with everything and just take somebody through it because they've read faster than you're going to read. They've looked faster than you can talk and you want to control their focus, like show them what you want them to be looking at when you're talking about it. So whether it's an image or it's bullet points, only bring up what you're talking about and, and make sure that the other parts come up dynamically in, in a fast enough order, like things should only be visible on a screen for less than like about a minute max before something else happens. Um, and, and so a dynamic assembly or animation using PowerPoint, people used to have this, like this, this sort of this like mantra of, of, um, uh, get rid of all animations, um, cause they were bad. And again, I don't think there was any data to support that. The data we have supports that you actually have to have animations to control focus, to keep people engaged, overcome the stimulation threshold, and keep people focused on the thing you want them to so that they hear it and remember it and don't like read ahead. I always say people, um, they conclude what you're going to say faster than you say it, and they might have drawn the wrong conclusion if you put everything up on the slide at one time. And, and then the third thing I would say is actually get them to write something down, get them to draw something along. I, Victor mentioned, I annotate on all my slides, uh, arrows, circles, add a couple extra words here, take notes. I, when I'm in a sales call, I ask the, the prospect or client something. I make the notes right on the slide so they can see I'm getting it. And if I didn't get it right, they correct me. I erase it and draw what's right. And all of a sudden it feels like a very engaging consultative type of experience. So, um, 10% slide, repeat your, use it as your agenda. 
um, animate your slides, make them build, use that as your friend to keep focus, control focus, gain attention, keep attention, and then ask them to, to, to like draw something along, get them to take out a piece of paper or pen, write down these numbers or draw this triangle and put these words around it. Um, we've been able to show that that actually not only increases processing, it increases preference and it increases memorability. So all the good things that you would want uh, when you engage people. So those are just three highlight, um, uh, blah, blah, blah. But um, those, No, it's, those it's good, three. blah, blah, blah. By the way, so you, you just said increases preference. Like, you know, give me an example of what that means. Um, when when we say, um, uh, how, how, how distinct was this vendor and this presentation from others like it that you've seen? Um, how urgent was the problem that you just heard about? How, um, how confident are you that this vendor is a viable alternative? And if we, like when we add the draw along, we do tests where we have them just watch the presentation mm -hmm. versus asking them to actually craft part of it, draw something along. So it's the one group is they're watching the same exact presentation, mm -hmm. hearing the same words and watching the same visuals. But in this test, they're adding this draw along component and we see double digit increases in the sense of urgency around the problem, not only the ability then to remember more about it, but then their willingness to engage in a next step. We ask them persuasive questions. That's what I mean by preference. They're so like, yes, I'd be willing to get a team and I'm willing to take a second meeting. I believe you're a viable vendor. I believe this problem is urgent and I need to consider it. Like we ask a series of behavioral mm -hmm. outcome questions after the experience and we see them all spike in the group that was asked to draw along. I love that, man. That, that is that, hopefully that's in the book as well. The, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned something cause that was, that was great. Uh, the way I'm gonna go back and listen to this podcast myself. Uh, you said a stimulation threshold. You mentioned that earlier. Is, is there a way to quantify that? Like if people listen to that go, well, what is the threshold? What does that mean? Is there any way to quantify some of that? Yeah, I think, um, Carmen, Dr. Simon has actual numbers on like when we watch movies on screens, like er everything that happens on our screens, whether it's games or whether how we view social media, it's just like swipe, 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 swipe. You know, like everything happens fast. Um, and that's what creates this threshold is we now our mind has been tricked into thinking when we're looking at a screen, a lot of things have to happen. Um, but I don't have the precise number of what it is, but I would tell you that, like I said, the repetition you need to repeat your main message six to eight times for sure in, the, in 12 to 20 minutes. And, and the idea is that when we are building slides anymore for companies, any given slide is got, I would say from five to 12 animations on it. And we're talking about slides that stay up for just a couple minutes. So there's just a lot of movement required. Uh, there's probably some calculation somewhere, but what I would tell you is all of it, even like take what anybody's doing today and double or triple it. And you're probably still not there yet. Um, so don't be afraid. Um, I, I don't believe you can over animate to be honest, uh, in today's day and age. Uh, now I might you not, it might not be swiping and flashing and, and all that kind of stuff, but building, um, and, and telling a story that way is, is, is absolutely where you need to go. That's great. You know, the, the thing you mentioned about the 10% the, the, the slide with the agenda slide, what I like about that is that when you show them, okay, we covered this already, you show them the agenda slide, again, it creates almost like this forward momentum in their brain, right? Like we're moving forward through this process. Yeah, I liken it to the, like when you're on a hiking trail mm -hmm. and, and you get those you are here sort of like yeah. post yeah. and it says you are here and you're like, oh, look how far we've come, look right. what we've accomplished. Oh, I know where I'm going next. Yeah. I have confidence. See, that's that this what, is that's what pisses somewhere. me off about you, team. See, that right there is what pisses me off about you. You just taken something and just made that visual very clear. And that's what you're very good at, man. Do you know what I mean? Metaphors, metaphors are your friend or analogies. Yeah. They can be abused, though. So Carmen, in her next study, we are right in the middle of a study on, right. on metaphors, right. uh, how to use, not abuse oh. metaphors. <laughs> um, don't mix them. Well, we don't know. We're, don't mix them. Don't use too many. Um, and, and don't overwrought one, like don't push it beyond, like don't ring yeah, out. Don't, like, don't every just <laughs> keep extending <laughs> right. that thing out. Yeah. Right. Right. Like at risk of, yeah, no. Um, so, uh, but we know it's a great learning cue heuristics. You and I study this yep. stuff like a shortcut and a well-placed metaphor. Um, yep. and you asked for it. I gave it, I didn't even think about it because I've had to answer that question before and, and to have it, you're ready. Yeah. A simple analogy or metaphor. 
again, the simple part of your brain goes, aha, thank you. You've made that concrete right. now. And, and guess what? The other good thing about a metaphor is make it something they've done before. Mm. Like, oh, I've made that decision before. Or, you know, and you're like, oh, it's, it's a little like buying a streaming service. And right. then you tell them why. And then somebody goes, oh, this isn't a hard decision. I've bought streaming services before. Mm -hmm. Like the metaphor also makes things not only more concrete and therefore mm -hmm. doable, it makes it easier because it makes that you take a familiar yeah. that they've already done so, like that, that worked out for me. So yeah. I guess I could do something like that again. So just another quick couple of hits there. I love it, man. A lot of science behind it. You know, again, you have several books. I'm still going to recommend, slides Demi, I'm still going to recommend, and my first recommendation to people will be the expansion sale. I love your other books, but this one right here I think is so relevant for today. Tim, closes out. Uh, why don't you give us some, uh, um, give some directions on where to get more information, your website, more about you, so forth and so on. Well, what I'll say is I agree with you on the expansion sale because every company, 70 to 80% of their revenue is coming from existing customers. Right. And if you didn't know that you need to approach them differently than you do prospects, yeah. then you got to look at That's big. Books. That's big. Uh, and so I would say corporate visions, mm -hmm. all one word, plural, corporatevisions.com, the resource library there, or B2B Decision Labs, and sign up for the newsletter. We do three, on average, three, sometimes four new studies every quarter. Mm -hmm. I'm running studies in each of our labs every quarter. So coming out the next quarter, win backs. You're going to want to learn more about that that's framework. Um, you're going to want to learn about metaphors. That's going to be coming out in this quarter. Um, that idea of how do you get salespeople to use the content. Mm -hmm. That study is going to come out this quarter. We're doing some new work on what we're calling wrong problem bias. How salespeople get biased on thinking that this is the problem, but that problem is actually not a big enough problem to get them to change. Interesting. And, and, you, and that happens in discovery. You discover things, you find a problem, and you latch on to it. That is so interesting, too. The only, oh. the only problem is that problem's not big enough to get them to change. Right. So we're doing a little research around what we're, we're tentatively calling wrong problem bias. Yeah. So there's always some stuff coming out, and you're just uh, – um, you just get on the newsletter and you'll be invited to the webcasts and to the downloads of the eBooks. And, and you can, uh, you can be as smart as Victor after this. Yeah. Or close. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> anyway, let me wrap this thing up again. Uh, check out him, check out his profile on LinkedIn, check out corporate visions, B2B insight labs. Is that correct? B2B decision labs. Decision labs. Decision Check decision. that out. And again, really, I you know I'm strongly suggesting, if not urging you, to get the books. Uh, by the way, I should personally thank you. Uh, I didn't do that when I read the expansion sale, uh, and I got to the part about growth. That motivated me to kind of start thinking about upselling, and I wrote the book Mastering the Upsell. So that was actually the catalyst for me writing that book. So I want to personally thank you, Tim. For that for you're welcome inspiration so again uh anyway that's it for the sales influence podcast leave me some feedback on itunes stitcher youtube wherever you're watching listening i'm sure tim wants to hear it check out tim's books and information and after you do that check out the sales velocity academy and on that note this is victor antonio always reminding you sell it ain't hard when you know a guy like tim reister and you know how to sell take care Big Tin Can is the world's leading sales learning and enablement platform that delivers the onboarding and training, preparation, coaching, customer engagement, and follow-up and insights that modern businesses need to win.